Hi, good morning. So I think we'd like to get started on time. I'm sure people will continue to trickle in as we go. We want to give our speakers ample time to cover some very exciting um, background in this really incre incredibly exciting and growing space of genetic therapies. So this session will be, um, is entitled Design of Clinical Trials to Evaluate Nucleotide-Based Interventions. I'm Claire Keating. I'm an adult pulmonologist at Columbia University in New York, New York, and my co-chair is Jane Davies, Professor of Pediatric Pulmonary from Imperial College, London. So this symposium will review considerations in study design, vector choice, conduct and design of trials, and outcomes measures in, this, in nucleotide based treatments, specifically um, mRNA, uh, DNA, and beyond. So our speakers will discuss current and active upcoming genetic therapy initiatives in people with cystic fibrosis. And what we hope to accomplish in this, and we will I'll review with you how you can submit questions as well um, to generate robust discussion. We want to differentiate therapies with regards to dosing, duration of effect, and identify key outcome measures that would, what would convince of e efficacy even in these early phase trials in nucleotide-based treatment. How do we identify target populations for treatment with genetic therapies? And what are the various delivery methods and how effective are they um, in genetic therapy trials? And then discuss also measures for safety monitoring in these first in human trials, first in CF and first in human, during active treatment and then during duration, long durations of follow-ups. So with that, we'll get started. Our first speaker is Marty Solomon. Yes. Oh, questions late, sorry, thank you. So you may have seen from the earlier session, so instead of um, microphones uh, here in the session, we want you to submit them electronically. So through the NACFC app, if you go to this session, which is S01, at the very bottom there's a Q&A button, um, and you can submit comments or questions, and we will continue to filter them. Instead of doing direct um, question answers after each speaker, we would like to bank the questions, but please continue to submit them real time during the speaker presentations. And at the end, we'll bring all of our speakers up for a panel discussion. Um, and again, it's continuously live, um, live input. All right, thank you. So our first speaker is Marty Solomon. He's Associate Professor of Medicine at University of um, Alabama in Birmingham. Um, he is a uh, so there's many, many roles there, but um, among others, uh, the adult um, TDN director of the CF Center. So, welcome. Okay. Okay. It's a quick start. Let's see. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you very much to Jane and to Claire for the opportunity to speak to you, days, to you guys today. I have to say I'm a, a little bit humbled to be speaking amongst the other panelists. Uh, I'm obviously uh, more junior, but I appreciate the opportunity to do this, and I will attempt to do this overview uh, its best justice. So I'll be talking on considerations for design and outcome measures for clinical trial of gene and mRNA-based therapies. Um, these are my disclosures, um, which are, um, let's see if I can get this to advance. Oh, got it, okay. Oh, great, okay, thanks. Okay, these are my disclosures. So by way of outline, uh, I'll discuss a bit about an understanding the guidance and prior experience in early phase development of genetic-based therapies for CF. I'll review the implementation and emerging data from early genetic-based trial designs, uh, just to think a bit about what that guidance really looks like. And I'll tell you that I drew heavily upon several guidance documents and will highlight some highlights of those uh, during this talk. And I, as my wife said, when she was looking at some of these pretty thick documents, they, she, I found them very exciting. She felt like they were sort of a cure for insomnia. So I have to say reading FDA guidance documents is not something I ever thought I'd be doing in my career, but I'm happy to be doing that. So, and then summarize some concepts for endpoints and recent experience, especially with CFTR biomarkers, which is a focus of my lab and our center's efforts. 
So as everyone has seen this slide probably before, we're, we're embarking on the path to a cure, and, and one of these obviously is the genetic-based therapies. I'll be abbreviating that as GBT throughout most, most of the discussion. I, I know we have a lot of different ways we express the, the concept of gene-based therapies. I've, I've come across gene, GBT as my kind of abbreviation, so I hope you guys will be okay if I use that. So the center point of this slide created by the CF Foundation is what do we need to figure out? And I, I think the answer to that question is many, many, many things. So hopefully I'll be embarking on help, telling you guys a bit about some of those things today as a prelude to the rest of this discussion. So there has been significant movement in across the spectrum of, of dis diseases and genetic-based therapies, or GBT, and this new cycle has really brought about developments of a really a incredible uh, next wave of um, developments in CF. And so this right-handed figure, I'm not going to go through it in any detail, but it's just something I would encourage you all to review, really summarizes the work that's been done to date uh, going back, uh, you know, two plus decades and thinking about uh, thinking about GBT and really tells us that there's been a lot of fits and starts and a lot of hard, hard work and effort, especially led by the UK Respiratory Gene Therapy Consortium. Um, and so I think their work really forms the basis of what we can think of as modern uh, GBT for CF. So I'll first start thinking about trial design a little bit, and I came across this quote by Henry Ford, if you, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So I think we have to continue to rethink where we're at with trial design as we go along with these therapies. And I, I suspect that the first wave will tell us what we're going to do with the next wave of therapies, et cetera, et cetera, and we'll learn a, a good bit more about these as we go along. So there are definite challenges when designing early or really any phase trial in the genetic-based therapy space. There are certainly cons concerns about safety that even outweigh the design of, of modulators or other CF therapeutics. There certainly is a, a push to understand really how we define efficacy in, ver in several fronts, and then all that has to be balanced with the recruitability of an increasingly more rare population, especially for the initial target of GBT and for non-modulator eligible patients accompanied by other factors, including uh, disease state and whatnot, which may uh, affect that. And also talk about recruitability of various populations, which may be enriched uh, for this um, in a few moments. And so what might be, might be concern, concerning here is that can we find that unicorn of the perfect cl tr clinical trial design that really links all these three and whether we can recruit patients in a safe manner, really answer these questions. So the, the work by Eric Alton and others with the UK Respiratory Gene Therapy, Therapy Consortium is really, I think, more recently defined for us what these trials may look like. I'm not going to highlight every detail of this, but just to say that there's been a few lessons, I think, learned from their recent work from liposomal delivery of CFTR uh, in, a phase, in, in a phase 1, 2A program, and then followed by, the, I think, the first really successful phase 2B kind of early efficacy trial uh, with, with GBT a few years ago. And so a few of the lessons learned is that we can use some of the, some of the common clinical endpoints to show some efficacy, including FEV1, although that was a little bit dubious in some of these trials. The other lesson learned is that we have to have efficacy biomarkers, and I think they began to define that potential difference measurements, especially in the lower airway for, for nebulized type therapies, uh, like is, is the main thrust for the current trial designs, uh, may be effective, although it's going to require a lot of standardization. And furthermore, there are a lot of endpoints as shown by this the bottom right figure, uh, that the bottom right forest plot, which shows that there are many endpoints that can be used to assess both safety and efficacy in an overlapping fashion, which I'll discuss a bit more as we go along. So one of the guidance documents that I relied upon heavily in preparing this talk was the FDA guidance document, which was originally, I believe, published in 2015, but it has remained with some updates in the last few years. And that guidance document uh, recognizes some unique aspects of GBT. The first is that GBT has unique at attributes compared to small, small molecule therapy pharmacologic products that are in development, such as modulators. And much of this is based on the potential for risk in this therapeutic category, which is obviously has borne out as, as a concern already in the CF field some years ago, and has also in the non-CF world as well. And so therefore, novel and altered clinical trial considerations are inherent to the nature of this type of research, especially in the early phase clinical trial development. Uh, much of this potential for risk is inherent to the therapeutic category due to the potential for immunogenicity from the vector and potentially for the gene product itself the risk of, the, of a prolonged effect even with a single or few doses, and the invasive nature in some instances of delivering these certain products, although I don't think that will be as much of an issue uh, with, uh, with nebulized therapies in this first wave. There's also unique considerations for pediatric populations that won't play a factor in initial trial design, but may as we go along in future trial designs we go to pediatric populations. 
In addition, uh, an emphasis on the preclinical data is extremely important to predict unique, the unique aspect of safety assessments and delivery of these, of these products in early phase designs. And so I know that there will be symposia looking at preclinical uh, design and modeling throughout this, um, throughout this uh, NACFC. I'd encourage you guys to attend those. I think they will answer some of those questions. And as a result, this all influences trial design and recruitment strategies for patients. In addition to that, say, thinking about consenting patients is, is more of a dubious uh, 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 process than it was when, when designing even small molecule therapies like modulators. This NIH statement delineates some of the key themes of appropriate informed consent for patients, which includes increased time for decision making, increased comprehensibility of language and communication, thinking about the, the native language of the, of the populations that are being consented, and a balance between the therapeutic motivation for those patients and the concern for risk when those patients have some therapeutic, uh, we might call desperation due to uh, having an end-stage illness which is not currently treated by therapies. Uh, this slide, which I appreciate Jennifer letting me present, uh, since she changed up her topic a bit today, uh, displays one, one of those uh, considering uh, those major concerns, which is thinking about the expanding population that we maybe have to recruit for for these therapeutic trials, including the BIPOC community with CF, uh, which is will have we think will have disproportionate trial inclusion uh, compared to CFTR modulator eligibility. So, as we know, the, the racial distribution of the CF USCF population is largely white. However, the population that has been involved with clinical trials mirrors that, mostly for modulators. We don't know if that will carry forward uh, with that same ethnic and given the fact that more patients in the Hispanic, black, and other uh, ethnic distributions are, 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 are ineligible for CFTR modelers. Therefore, there will probably be a, an increased need to recruit towards those patient populations as we go along. And so that should be considered in trial design, especially considering aspects of recruitability and whatnot. In addition to that, there are unique aspects that have been uh, displayed in the, in the FDA guidance and other documents uh, about early phase clinical trial design for GBT. First, this is a greater emphasis on pause between dose escalations in phase 1b type studies with first and disease state, with a step up approach uh, and, and initial dose escalations being the, 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 the primary method for doing this and, and what's recommended. This is borrowed largely from the cancer literature, which has used this in, in early safety trials, where you do sort of a a, few, a handful of patients pause, do safety assessments with staggering doses, and then step up. And I know this, this design was, was used in the 4DMT project that I'm sure Jim will talk about a little bit later. In addition, and what can't be emphasized enough, is the requirements for prolonged safety follow-up. So depending on the type of vector and the integration level of the gene transfer therapy that's being used, this is, necessitates as much as a 15-year safety follow-up. So that will play a large factor in recruitability and the design of trials we go along. And to answer the question on what endpoint we should use for that plong, I, I, the answer is I don't, have a, I don't have an answer for that. However, we will be considering as we go along. In addition, there are special considerations for monitoring and, and GBT that are unique to, this, to these types of trials, which include individual subject monitoring for immunogenicity, uh, determining the uh, persistence of the GBT uh, products. Some of these can persist, especially if they're integrating. Uh, the potential for viral shedding, depending on the type of virus that uses a vector, if that's the type of vector that's selected, and whether or not if the GBT is integrating, can it cause genomic issues like malignancy or clonal populations? And finally, if testing in pediatric, there are special considerations which are outlined in several of the FDA guidance documents about specific uh, uh, ther therapeutic monitoring that affects uh, both development and growth for pediatric patients. In addition, it's, uh, it's outlined very extensively in the FDA guidance documents that proof of concept will be a very key portion of the development of these early phase trials for GBT. And so I'm, rather than speaking at this in, in great detail, this is going to be outlined in, in Symposia 21. I would encourage you guys to attend that, and, and this will be discussed in some detail in one, one of those symposia talks. But the concept here, of course, is that, that efficacy in target tissue interacts with the delivery of the target to the, to the, right, ther to the right cells and the right, um, right therapeutic area. And so we think that interactions of CFTR functional assays in the context of these early phase clinical trials may be a fertile area for designing these types of proof of concept trials as we go along. So I've brought up the concept of endpoint several times, so I'll turn to think about that a bit in the second half of this talk. So this, this slide, uh, this uh, figure by uh, Nicole Mayer Hamblett uh, was put out uh, a couple of years ago, and I, I think she'll discuss in, in the plenary discussion tomorrow uh, about this, but 
there are several different things and roles that an endpoint can have as far as a performance measure in a, in a clinical trial. And I think we have to be uh, we have to be wary of overemphasizing how good these endpoints are in a, in a new therapeutic space. So they certainly can be markers of biological efficacy. Maybe they have clinical correlations. I think we'll learn more about that as we go through the first wave of these trials, whether or not these have clinical correlations, as we've learned with. 20, 15 plus years of modulator trial experience, but I don't think any of these can be considered surrogate type endpoints. So we have to consider these as sort of a conglomeration of efficacy and safety endpoints that would be effective for this. And so this next slide tries to get at the concept of interaction between safety and efficacy endpoints. So in early phase trials, we may consider FEV1 with delivery of a, of a nebulized therapy to be an efficacy, but also a safety endpoint ensuring there's not issues with um, patient, patient safety regarding the, the actual nebulization of the product as one example. I also think we have to think about the concept that we don't have to let perfection be the enemy of good enough for these initial trials. We have to do a few of these to, to learn more and go from there as far as efficacy endpoints. There is, a, of course, a spectrum of CF of biomarkers, which will be discussed, as I, as I mentioned earlier, fully uh, and, and come out of a genetic therapies working group document I would encourage you all to read. It came out of written, led by uh, Deepika Polonini and others of us that are on the genetic therapies working group. This kind of working guidance document outlines several different type of clinical biomarkers, which are summarized here, and I believe will be summarized more fully uh, in, in that discussion, but really center upon the themes of clinical efficacy, physiological efficacy, safety related to delivery, and safety related to the vector itself. And these align with the FDA guidance we discussed previously. So in thinking about biomarkers for these types of proof of concept studies and thinking about physiologic efficacy and delivery efficacy, there's really a balancing thing that has to be, has to be assessed between expression, gene, gene product expression, the target tissue, and function. And so efficacy endpoints for these types may be thought about in these two, two veins. And the current CFF guidance document acknowledges that physiologic and pathologic efficacy will have to be paired in proof of concept in early phase clinical trials, which is in line with the FDA guidance, is actually the suggested approach in those guidance documents. So we, we have a, a pretty good workhorse uh, for, for CFTR efficacy and physiologic efficacy in the form of, of sweat chloride. However, despite significant evidence that this is an effective biomarker for modulators, this won't work for nebulized therapy. So we don't have a systemic administration. Mm -hmm. We'll probably bring sweat chloride back as we go along, but at this point it won't be the workhorse endpoint for this, this purpose. So there, and therefore, we must think about what are the in vivo assays which can test the direct proof of concept in, in, the, in a tipping point compared to in vitro assays. In vivo assays, besides that, that, that look at approximation of the target tissue, in this case, delivery to the lower airways, and uh, the target tissue itself with biological pl plausibility, I think tip us towards in vivo type biomarkers um, that will, will better answer this question rather than sweat chloride in the current trial design. Nasal potential difference is uh, um, an assay that's near and dear to some of those in this room and also near and dear to my heart uh, and, and sort of brought about, was brought back as a, an assay and, uh, after some standardizations in, in the early 2010s and really was um, a, a key proof of concept biomarker in early phase trials for CFTR modulators. This is just one example of data showing rescue of CFTR dependent uh, potential difference uh, from the Vertex 2A phase trials uh, conducted some years ago. And so some international collaborations uh, have resulted in standardization of this interface and data capture methods. And, and, and as some of you are aware, in, in gene-based therapy trials, NPD has been used for nasal delivery of gene-based products. So we, we questioned whether we could take standardization methods previously encountered by our team uh, and by our group and apply those to, to lower airway, to, for lower airway uh, potential difference measurements, which I'll talk about for the next few moments. Uh, potential difference measurement as a, as a goal uh, after, after standardization has been validated more recently uh, in one of the early uh, antisense oligonucleotide therapies, Elufrasin for F508 del CFTR, a trial that several centers conducted in a multi-center fashion for proof of concept, with the primary endpoint here of improvements in the total chloride conduction, which is the CFTR dependent potential difference and sodium transport via NPD with, with nasal delivery of this tissue. So this further tells us that potential difference measurements in more recent stops, trials can be used in a multi-center fashion if standardized appropriately. And so if we think about bronchoscopic placement of a potential difference catheter, we can, we can begin to develop uh, ideal type of data, which has been done in our center before, but not on a, on a, on a fashion that could be, um, 
could be moved or moved towards multi-center type trials. So there are several challenges with LAPD or lower airway potential difference implementation for larger center multi-center trials in CF. These include necessitation of an OR procedure, uh, the fact that the catheter is a derivation of the nasal potential difference catheter, which has previously been developed, which is not commercially manufactured. Um, there's this longer catheter has issues in the current design uh, with intrinsic failure rates and, and increased resistance to a longer catheter necessary to get to the lower airways. And this bronchoscopic guidance uh, is the only real means at present to, in, to ensure epithelial contact. Um, so therefore, we think that, that uh, an improvement upon this method may allow this to be a, a novel uh, efficacy endpoint for CFTR physiologic uh, restoration uh, if, if further um, improved upon. So we have embarked on developing a next-gen LAPD system or lower airway potential difference system in collaboration with, uh, with um, Gary Tierney's group at the Wellman Center for Photomedicine at MGH uh, in, in a long-standing collaboration. This would involve an integrated console system which can be used at multiple sites uh, in a much more simplified fashion in an OR or potentially even an outpatient fashion with a very small catheter which has some significant advantages which I'll delineate here in just a few moments. So the advantage of this catheter and system is it was it was um, overcomes the limitations of prior potential different systems. It uses a very small diameter system with, with very stable electrodes, which are built into the catheter itself. So therefore, pre-construction is not necessary. Uh, it has con and also has conventional OCT image guidance to to confirm location ep and epithelial contact, and is compatible with an endoscopic working channel and potentially could be used in unsedated patients uh, for use in, in sort of more compact plug and play type console to use for multiple centers, uh, akin to what was done with the MPD trial that I showed you guys data for a few moments ago. And so our plans for this new LAPD apparatus are to provide a minimally invasive LAPD measurement technology for CF therapeutic trials, really thinking about these early phase proof of concept and early efficacy endpoints uh, for physiologic endpoints that could be used in unsedated and minimally sedated patients, could be a rapidly convenient procedure and could be done but potentially even in an outpatient setting by, by, trained, uh, by trained personnel and could be done at multiple centers. And so currently we're conducting a pilot study using the nasal passage as an assay to, to look at this catheter um, with, with enrolling patients with and without CF and normals uh, and, and patients on and off modulators in an NPD trial to, to validate the actual catheter, which could then be used in a lower airway potential difference uh, validation study, which we'll be conducting in the early parts of next year. This is early evidence from our group showing that there's comparable basal and perfusion measurements, including key measurements of, of sodium transport, the exchange of a milleride, and the CFTR dependent uh, potential difference measurement using this compared to our previous uh, ag agar catheter system, which was developed in the previous standardization wave some years ago. So in addition to thinking about physiologic efficacy, we have to balance thinking about the efficacy of, of endpoints um, re related to um, the, the gene delivery to cells and the tropism to those cells. So there are significant considerations in sampling that will also be reviewed in, in that second symposium. So I don't want to overlap too much with that. But suffice to say that there is a, a changing landscape of the, the necessary cell to deliver into the lower airways, including the, develop, the recent discovery of ionocytes and other cell types, which may play a key factor in the delivery and efficacy of cells depending upon the delivery to those particular types of cells. And so the efficiency of this delivery is, is necessary to, to prove as an efficacy endpoint in early phase trials, as well as avoidance of off-target effects. And then really the secondary factor in, in thinking about, about appropriate biopsy is the assessment of the local immune activation, which may, may lead to systemic immune reactions. And so I'll, I'll not cover too much about what can be measured, because I know it's going to be discussed by Deepika Polanyi tomorrow in the symposia, but we have been developing a, an add-on bi biopsy system to our OCT system that would use the, the concept of cryobiopsy, which can do partial or full thickness epithelial biopsy throughout the airway, the lower airways. This is data from um, initial animal, uh, animal sources showing that we can in fact do this safely in, in, in a porcine model. And so we have ongoing optimization to use this cryobiopsy as an add-on probe uh, to our OC, to our, uh, sorry, our LAPD system, which is under development, that could use for partial thickness cryobiopsy to be able to answer a lot of these questions of tropism and delivery um, in a larger fashion. So in the interest of time, I'm going to conclude by saying there are significant opportunities for optimizing trial design and execution in GBT 
Uh, the in vitro and in vivo CFTR biomarkers have been key to the development of CFTR-directed therapies, and I think they will play, continue to play a, a key role in these in the future. And the optimization of in vivo biomarkers is a work in progress to determine ideal options for proof of concept in early phase trials uh, for GBT. And I'll be happy to answer any questions when we get to the uh, portion of the, uh, the, the um, we're doing a panel. panel. Right, so I'll be happy to answer any portions of the panel. I really have to acknowledge the patient participants in our trials locally and, and at, at our center. Really acknowledge our RC team, especially led by Heather Hathorne, my collaborators at both at UAB and at uh, MGH, and then my funding sources through NIH and CFF. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marty, and thank you for sticking to time despite a lot of uh, material in there. Yeah. Very much appreciated. I'm not too sure personally about the GBT acronym. It sounds a little bit like GBH to me, um, which actually after 20 years working with Eric in the Gene Therapy Consortium is perhaps a bit apt. So um, <laughs> anyway, it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Jen taylor Kauzar. Um, who is a professor both of internal medicine and pediatric respiratory medicine. She's the TDC director at National Jewish, and she's the global lead for the 4D710 AAV trial. So we're very excited to have Jen along. I'm very pleased that she's actually going to be able to show us some very early data from this trial. So uh, thank you very much, Jen. Could I just also say, somebody has already put a question on. Please follow their lead. It's going to be a hard job for Claire and me if there are no questions on here. Um, and it, please, please do sort of put whatever questions you can as we're going along. Thanks, Jen. So thanks very much to the organizers for the opportunity to speak today and for Jane and Claire letting me throw them a little bit of a curveball at the end. Okay, so these are my disclosures, which uh, most relevant to this one, as Jane mentioned, I'm the national PI for the 4D trial. So as all of you are aware in this room, the majority of people are now variant eligible for highly effective CFTR modulators. But the highly effective modulators are not a cure, and they still require people to take pills every day for the rest of their lives. Furthermore, 6% of patients, approximately, do not have access to highly effective modulator therapy because they're ineligible based on their variants. Also, there are some people we know who are not able to take the modulators because of intolerance. So we do still have work to do. So back in 1989, the CFTR gene was discovered through a collaboration between Lap Chi Choi, Jack Riordan, and Francis Collins. Because this was a monogenetic disorder, people thought gene therapy will be around the corner. Unfortunately, as you all are well aware, that did not happen at the time. This is just an example of the timeline between 1989 when the gene was discovered and 2001. So they did actually show proof of concept about using adenovirus for gene therapy. And they thought that as few as 6 to 10% of successfully transducted cells would actually be therapeutic. And they began to do these trials. However, none of them panned out. Then they actually moved on to adeno-associated vector trials. There were six trials with AAV2-directed therapy in the upper and lower airways. So when they did nasal sinus administration in three trials, there were 34 people who were dosed. It was safe and well tolerated. However, they detected DNA and they saw transgene expression as well as CFTR function by NPD when it was given nasally. However, when they got to the lungs, the story was a bit different. So there were three trials. There were 84 participants with mild to moderate lung disease. It was safe and well tolerated, and they did actually detect DNA. However, there was no transgene expression, and there was no change in percent predicted FV1. So you might ask, should we keep looking at AAV? And you'll hear about some other potential viral vectors, and Marty mentioned Eric's work with liposomal transfer. But there are some advantages to AAV. So those include a relatively lower risk of pathogenicity, a relatively longer duration of expression in non-proliferating cells, a broad range of target organs that are potentially able to be impacted because of the number of serotypes, a lack of a strong immune response in many of those serotypes, and a low risk of insertional mutagenesis. 
there are some disadvantages. So the AAV receptor is on the base lateral rather than the apical surface, making it more difficult to reach it. Also, it's got a relatively small genome packaging capacity. There is potential for pre-existing or inducible antibodies and the potential for hepatotoxicity with high dose IV delivery is present. And then finally, it's unclear if repeat dosing is going to be possible. However, there are again advantages in spite of some of those disadvantages. And so the thought, again, sort of going back to Marty's talk about rethinking how you're gonna do a similar approach, this approach is called the therapeutic vector evolution. So really, you think about what disease you want to target, cystic fibrosis. What organ do you want to target? Well, people die from their lung disease. So the specific profile that you want to look at is something that can be delivered directly to the lungs via aerosol in a dose that's less than 3 times 10 to the 15th vector genomes per person. Tissue target, again, lung epithelium, and you want to have antibody resistance. So lots of us are used to thinking about high throughput screening for modulators. So this is sort of analogous to that where almost a million synthetic capsids were developed. And instead of being tested in vitro in cells, they were tested in non-human primates with a commercial delivery through aerosol nebulization. And then they went through competitive selection. The tissues were analyzed and they continued to look to find the optimized vector one with really good tropism and specificity and they came up with A101. So if you think about conventional, naturally occurring vectors, there are multiple potential barriers. So defensins, antibodies, the thick mucus that exists in people's lungs, and what we saw in those early trials was very limited transduction. So again, A101 was designed with some key attributes that were supposed to overcome those barriers, include efficiency of mucus penetration, resistance to pre-existing human antibodies, transgene expression efficiency, and high specificity for the lungs. So let's talk a little bit about the preclinical characterization. I'd like to focus first on the top left. So A101 showed far superior resistance to human antibodies when tested in human cells. If you then focus on the bottom, when you look at the lung-specific delivery following a single aerosolized dose in non-humans primates, you can see that it was very specific for the lungs with minimal copies in the other organs. If you go up to the top right, in a dose-finding study, we looked at the distribution in non-human primate lung, and you can see that there was a robust number of genome copies on the left in the blue, and in the aqua, you also see that there was expression. And then if you look down at the bottom, you can see that there was a dose-dependent increased protein expression in the trachea and in the bronchi and in the alveoli, in the non-human primates. And this was distributed in all cell types in these non-human primates. So just to summarize the hurdles that should be overcome by the A101 vector compared to conventional therapy, it was developed through directed evolution in non-human primates for aerosol delivery with a commercially available nebulizer. There was efficient mucus production and transgene expression in these non-human primates. There was a high resistance to pre-existing AAV antibodies, and it was very specific for the lungs. So if you look at the 4D710 product, there is a targeted and evolved vector, again, A101, and the previous um, historical use was with AAV2. There was also, with this product, a strong promoter, whereas the conventional AAV therapy had no exogenous promoter. So that takes us to the design of the phase one to first in human trial. So it's an open, la open label phase one, two trial in modulator ineligible adults with CF. If you focus first on the top, it's a dose exploration cohort that was done with one times 10 to the 15th or one E vector genomes with the plan to have a safety review and then move on to the higher dose at two times 10 to the 15th vector genomes and then figure out which dose works the best and then move on to another expanded cohort. So then focusing on the bottom, potential participants are screened for 28 days. Prior to administration of a single dose of 4710, they receive oral prednisone. 
They're then seen repeatedly in clinic, and then at day 28, they have a bronchoscopy. Then they're followed for the first 12 months, and then subsequently for the additional year after that. So the study objectives are one, to evaluate a single nebulized dose, both in low dose and high dose of 4017, t to look at the safety, tolerability, and immunogenicity, to assess transduction and transgene expression in the lung using biopsies, look at the impact on pulmonary function as measured by percent predicted FV1, the impact on health-related quality of life as measured by the CF questionnaire revised, and then identify a recommended phase two dose. Key inclusion criteria. So they have to be adults. They have to have a confirmed diagnosis of CF lung disease. They must be ineligible for CFTR modulator therapy based on the United States prescribing information, or they can discontinue it due to intolerance. Their percent predicted FV1 must be between 50 and 100, and their resting oxygen saturations are greater than 92% on room air. One of the key exclusions is prior gene therapy. You can see all of the exclusion criteria on clintrials.gov. So our primary endpoint, the incidence and severity of adverse events, key secondary endpoints, transgene transfer and expression in bronchoscopy samples, both biopsies and brushings, change in percent predicted FV1 from baseline through month 12, and then change in CFQR scores through month 12. So let's move on to cohort one. So the characteristics of the first three participants, their age range was 24 to 36. Two of them were male. All of them were non-Hispanic white. In terms of their CFTR modulator eligibility, two were um, variant ineligible, one was intolerant. Their sweat chlorides were between 74 and 110, and they had mild to moderate CF lung disease with PPFV1s of 69 to 94. So all of them received the full administration of the initial dose. One participant had a mild, limited AE of dry fatigue, dry throat and fatigue during the administration. But as you can see, there was no bronchospasm in this participant or the other two as evidenced by the figure on your left. So percent predicted FV1 is on the y-axis and pre and mid and post-dosing FV1 is shown across the x-axis. So to summarize the safety, there were no 4D7T related adverse events, no serious adverse events, and no dose limiting toxicities. So I mentioned that there was a bronchoscopy at day 28. One participant, in fact, had a pulmonary exacerbation that was thought not related to drug administration. So their bronchoscopy was postponed until week eight. So what was the bronchoscopic sampling plan? I've shown it both on the left in the table and on the right in the figure. So we were doing endobronchial biopsies in the right middle lobe and middle lobe carina. on the left as well, and then brushings were occurring in both lower lobes in the basal segment, again depicted also in the figure. So what we saw was consistent transduction across participants and lung regions. So if you look first on the left, all five biopsies were positive for 4D7T, 710 DNA. And then looking at the right, There was gene expression as well in all the biopsies from each of the participants. Looking at the corresponding histology, on the left I'm shown controls. So the first control is actually a participant with a very nonspecific probe. The bottom control is untreated commercially available CF lung tissue. But if you look at the 40X and the 80X images, you can see that there was RNA expression by in situ hybridization. And this is just an example from participant one, but it was seen in all three participants. There was also an independent review by two separate pathologists to look at the bronchial epithelial cell types that were affected. You can see that it was seen in basal cells as indicated by number one, goblet cells as indicated by number two, and columnar ciliated cells as indicated by number three. Again, participants also had brushing, and you can see that there again is RNA expression by in situ hybridization, again with the controls shown on the left. 
So the cohort one summary is that there were no 4D710 related adverse events post-dosing. There was widespread CFTR expression in all 11 samples. 40% of cells expressed CFTR in multiple bronchial cell types. And we think the implications are that A101 is a vector that's validated in the lung at this point, and clinical proof of concept shows that there is 4D710 transgene delivery and expression. So the next steps, we are moving now on to cohort two at the higher dose of two times 10 to the 15th vector genomes per dose. We're also going to be looking at an assessment of clinical activity, including FV1 and quality of life. And then ultimately, again, use of modulators is not a cure. Consider 4D710 combination therapy in individuals with CF who are on CFTR modulators. So in summary, the majority of people with CF at this point are eligible, at least by variant, for a CFTR modulator, but there are those who are intolerant, those who don't have access, and as Marty showed earlier, the black, indigenous, and people of color population of those with CF is overrepresented in that last group who needs a therapy. It's really important that we get there for them. When CFTR was discovered, we thought gene therapy was around the corner. Unfortunately, that did not pan out at that point, but we think we have overcome some of the limitations of previous viral vectors with the development of the A101 vector. So today I've shown you proof of concept that we may actually be able to successfully deliver AAV therapy. With that, I will stop and say thanks to the people with the CF and their families who were willing to go into this first inhuman trial. The participating CF clinical and research sites, uh, JP Clancy, loan me a slide, thanks JP, and 4D for all the slides that they helped with. Again, the CF Foundation obviously and the Ther Therapeutics Development Network are key in developing all these therapies for people with CF. And with that, I will step down and wait for questions at the end. Thank you very much, Jen. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions coming through on the app for that. Um, so it's my pleasure now to introduce our third speaker, um, Peter Walk, who is a conjoint professor at the University of Newcastle in Australia, um, and who's working uh, closely with Crystal Biotech on the HSV vector trial. So thank you very much, Peter, for coming such a long way and agreeing to present to us this morning. Thank you very much, and um, thank you very much for the organisers for inviting me to, to come and speak, and um, for the assistance that Crystal Biotech has, um, has provided with the slides today. Um, this is really quite an exciting session, and, and we really are faced with uh, a move towards some, some very novel treatments and some really novel concepts that I think will take forward a lot of the treatments that we've used and, and really the management of conditions that, that go beyond just being able to rely upon medication. So once again, cystic fibrosis hopefully will be one of those conditions which is going to lead the way forward here. And okay, those are my disclosures. Um, very obviously, um, for um, Crystal for um, uh, having me as uh, the, the PI in Australia on the phase one clinical trials. So we've heard about um, the, the genetics that sit behind um, uh, cystic fibrosis and CFTR. And of course, we only know what we know. And while um, uh, we um, have focused upon modulators that are available for the large majority of people out there with cystic fibrosis, we have got a greater appreciation that there are different variants out there that may not be as well addressed by current modulator therapy as what, um, what we understand. And so while we've characterised this very nicely in European, North American and Australian populations, uh, the emerging world has, has certainly told us that there's, there's really a, a much broader group of, of pot uh, potential genetic defects out there. And um, as we've had increasing immigrant populations to our countries, we're starting to see most unusual genetic variants that are simply not being covered by our mutations. So we at least know that 10% of people will not be covered by highly effective CFTR modulators. And we know that there are also some limitation of those modulators as well. And so this is not necessarily going to be an alternative, but could also be seen as a supplementary treatment for, for the use of small molecular modulators as well. 
So we know at best that the modulators that we currently have available probably restores the FTR function somewhere in excess of 50%. That clearly has had highly significant responses in terms of clinical efficacy with both improvements in exacerbation frequency reduction, improvement in lung function, and they can be delivered, as we've heard, in the vast majority of, of people with CF. However, is this going to be enough to really alter the progression of a disease and the disease trajectory over time? And of course, as it has been said, this is anything but a cure. And even within that population, there is variation. Now, this doesn't all come down to that, sing that single gene defect, and I'm sure there are many disease-modifying agents there as well. But even when we look at a concept such as change in lung function, we can see quite a broad response there that, that goes beyond what we would expect to see. And so we really still do have quite a long way to go. This is an example of people with a minimal functioning mutation and um, Delta F508. But you can see a, a very similar sort of response in terms of people even whom are homozygous for Delta F508 and whom the current CFTR modulators have been specifically engineered in order to work effectively. So a little bit about the KB407 program. Um, so this is the first um, program to look at an inhaled investigational HSV1 gene vector for gene therapy. <clears throat> So you're all very familiar, of course, with, with wild-type HSV1, and this, this vector has been specifically engineered to be replication incompetent and to reduce the risk of significant adverse events. Now, we know that HSV is a highly effective virus. It's evolved over millennia to evade our immune response and also is a highly effective virus at being able to get into a broad range of human cells, and of course, including the airway epithelial cells. It also has a very high carrying capacity, which is, is quite unique at greater than 30 kilobases and it also can be delivered with high efficiency to the airways, as you'll see. So this um, vector has been used quite successfully in the, a dermatological act, um, application. This is a condition called dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, which is really a horrible condition of um, a disorder in the collagen 7 gene and leads to really quite aggressive, deforming skin disease that leads to lesions which are, are at best um, uh, uh, very difficult to manage and cause significant problems. And the patients suffer from open wounds, recurring infections, and it's really quite a tragic disorder. Um, BVEC is a, a HSV delivery system that has delivered the, collagens, um, the collagen 7 protein formulated in a topical delivery application. And in a phase 1, 2 trial, as you can see here, if I can... Oh. There we go. Um, you can see um, the, the gene expression um, in biopsies from the phase one, two trial. And in the early phase, phase three trial, six months of, of monthly um, uh, delivery topically of the gene therapy led to significant improvement in clinical outcomes and a significant improvement in wound healing. So KB407 is, of course, an inhaled version of this, and it's designed specifically for the treatment of cystic fibrosis. As I said, it's a replication incompetent HSV1. It delivers two copies of the human CFTR transgene, so a full-length CFTR protein. The gene size is greater than 4,000 base pairs. The duration is, is sought to take around about 30 minutes via a mesh nebulizer. And it then delivers the CFTR gene um, to directly. Um, ability to redose again based on the same system and adjust the dose with the in the future as well. <coughs> And we can demonstrate that in mammalian cells that there is at least full genetic, uh, full glycosylated gene transfer into those cells. And you can see the presence of CFTR DNA being delivered, but most importantly, you can see the fully glycosylated protein present on Western blots. And when you apply this to a, a swelling organoid model, 
um, you can also see significant improvement. So these organoids have been derived from an individual with a class one or two individuals with class one mutations. And you can see on the right here the vehicle and then the gene KB407 transfer. And you can see an obvious change in swelling assay present there, at least showing that functional restoration in these organoid models. Um, and non-clinical studies in, in non-human pr primates has also shown no significant adverse events and demonstrated a proof of concept. So 36 non-human primates received three weekly doses, um, high dose, low dose and placebo. Inhaled delivery using the same mesh nebulizer as what it will be used in the phase one trials in humans. They saw no significant toxic toxicity based on mortality, clinical observations, body weights, or clinical and anatomical findings either. There was a very mild mixed mononuclear neutrophilic infiltrate within the lower airway that didn't seem to be related at all to any clinical symptoms in the animals. Um, and there was no significant adverse impacts that were detected throughout the process. But most importantly, we were able to demonstrate that KB407 capably infected airway tissue from these primates with limited biodistribution that went beyond the lung. So you can see reasonable levels here within lung tissue, but not within other tissues from the primates. And when you look at in situ hybridization, you can see day one following administration, significant uptake within the lung tissue there or significant expression within the lung tissue. And by tw day 28, there is still some evidence of that there, though it starts to wane by that stage. So KB407 encodes two full-length copies of human CFTR. Clinical validation of a H HSV1 vector platform has been done in dystrophic epi epidermolysis bullosa. Dose-dependent CFTR expression in CF patient-derived small airway epithelial cells has been demonstrated. We can confirm Western blot analysis of fully glycosylated CFTR. Functional correction of um, CFTR phenotype has been demonstrated with a 3D organoid model. It's stable after mesh nebulization and the generation of particles within a respirable range. Expression in airways of, of non-human primates has been demonstrated with inhaled delivery, and that has been done safely in those models. So we're about to embark on a phase one trial now. Um, this will be the first in human use of the HSV1 vector via an inhaled route. Um, we'll have to obviously, as been, has been very nicely demonstrated by Marty, focus primarily on safety but also take some consideration about feasibility and early efficacy. This also will be an open label versus randomised um, placebo controlled trial. And we also will be targeting adults um, with an FEV1 in the range where we should be able to see some efficacy with time. So the study design, as I mentioned, open label, sequential escalating dosing cohorts, follow up at um, visit 60 days after the, the last dose in each cohort, um, and then additional long-term follow up at one year. Dosing is going to start with the first cohort, which will be a single dose study at 10 to the nine PFU per dose, um, which, which is approximately eight mils and will be delivered by the mesh nebulizer. And that administration time is thought to be around about less than 30 minutes. We'll recruit adults age 18 and older, Confirm diagnosis of CF, FEV1 sitting between 50 and 100% predicted. We will initially be allowing CFTR modulators in this group um, as well, just to, to be able to start recruitment. So safety is going to be the primary endpoint predominantly here with assessment of adverse events, physical examination, clinical findings that would be fairly standard for, for assessment. Um, we will be looking at some clinical endpoints, but the ability to demonstrate that in that phase one um, period is, is, is going to be unlikely. So change from baseline and percent predicted FEV1, um, but we'll look for some exploratory endpoints with LCI, some PROMs with CFQR, and also look for transgene expression in buccal swabs. So in summary, HSV1 is a, a unique approach. It will allow the delivery of a full-length CFTR protein. It has been demonstrated with topical application in dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. 
And it's the ability to, to deliver this without a significant immune response that will allow repeat dosing. And we're about to commence a phase one clinical trial. So fingers crossed and, and very exciting. And thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. And our last speaker um, is Eric Alton, who has come here from the Imperial, Imperial College of London, where he is a professor of respiratory medicine. Um, he's also one of the lead directors of the UK Gene Therapy Consortium. Well, good morning, and I'd like to thank the organisers for the very kind invitation to speak, which I'm doing on behalf of a partnership, a partnership between... You'll have to guess who the partnership is between. <laughs> uh, partnership between the UK Respiratory Gene Therapy Consortium and Boehringer Ingelheim. And the aim of this partnership is to bring a first-in-class lentiviral-based gene therapy into the clinic for patients with cystic fibrosis. My talk is going to be in two bits, primarily looking at um, where we got to with this product, and uh, secondly, just to give you an indication of some of the points that we spend discussing over and over again. In in terms of disclosures, Boehringer have part funded this study. They've also had a chance to look at the slides. But whatever I'm about to tell you are the opinions of the UK Respiratory Gene Therapy Consortium. Now, during this talk, I'm going to make reference to this eminent gentleman. And I just want to give you a very clear indication of a strong conflict of interest. <laughs> <coughs> so, this journey has been some 20 years for us, and it started with Sendai virus. Sendai is the most extraordinary virus. It's in this room at the moment. You're all inhaling it. And it is the absolute best way of transferring genes into the respiratory epithelium. Now, the next picture I'm going to show you is the airway of a ferret. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever had dealings with ferrets, if you do, you will know of the, their uncompromising attitude towards researchers, and the amount of data I can show you were limited by the surviving number of investigators. So what we did was we put a gene, beta-galactoside A, saying turn cells blue, into the Sendai, and I think you can see in the target epithelium, every single cell in every ferret and every species always turns blue. This is fantastic. The snag is, as with almost all viral vectors that we've tested, expression is brief, it lasts for a few weeks, and of course, CF being a chronic disease, we need to do this repeatedly, and this is where it all goes horribly wrong. When we repeatedly administer Sendai, or indeed most other viral vectors, the body's immune system says, I've seen that before, I'm going to get rid of it, and you do not see this efficient expression after three or more doses. Great for nature papers, useless for CF gene therapy. Now, the reason this is so good is because Sendai looks like this, and it has these proteins on the surface called F and HN proteins, and those proteins respectively linked to, if we can go back, I have no idea, they respectively linked to uh, cholesterol and sialic acid receptors, and those are present on the epithelium. So the Dumbledore magic that what we need here is to retain that fantastic transfection efficiency, but we need a viral vector that can be repeatedly administered. And lentiviral vectors do have a reputation of being stealth, of getting under the immune system, so we turned our attention to lentiviruses. Unfortunately, the surface proteins here that you see, these spike proteins, are not recognized by any receptor on the respiratory epithelium. So that is useless for CF gene therapy. And here is the Sendai virus, which is equally useless for CF gene therapy. And what we really need here is a, flish, a flick of the wand and to do some magic. And that's what we try to do, and to pseudotype the lentivirus, so it now has the FHN proteins of Sendai on the lentivirus, hopefully to combine both of these elements. So does it do that? So in terms of gene transfer efficiency, 
We have looked at a whole range of species, and here, for example, is GFP, the protein that we put, the gene we put into the lentivirus, and I think you can see we get pretty good transfection efficiency in the mouse. One day we realized that perhaps mice are not people, and we better look at a whole zoo of other animal species, and we've looked all the way through to non-human primates, and we see that high efficiency. But it still occurs to us, of course, animals are not people, and we've done quite a lot of work showing high efficiency in human uh, tissues, and these have ranged uh, from air liquid interface cultures through to nasal brushings and through to human uh, lungs that were not suitable for transplantation. In terms of nasal brushings, it does evoke some very fond memories of Professor Davis approaching one uh, with the equivalent of a very small toilet brush, pinning one's head against the laboratory wall so you don't move, uh, twirling it fairly aggressively in one's nose, saying, trust me, I'm a doctor, this won't hurt a bit. So the next question then is, why is it so efficient? And I think it is because our vector is agnostic to the cell type it transduces. So here is a transduced cell shown by GFP. We can prove the cell is ciliated because we've double stained with tubulin, and there is that double staining. And we then worked our way through the different cell types that were available, and we looked at the secretory cells and the club cells, the goblet cells, and indeed we can transduce basal cells. I would say this is a rare event. This is a pseudostratified epithelium, and it's going to be very tricky to hit those basal cells. But I think the reason it's so good is it's agnostic to cell type. So the next question is whether our vector does what it says on the tin and give you long-lasting expression. So here is gene expression on the vertical axis here, and these are the number of days going out to one and a half years after a single dose of our viral vector. The different colors just simply represent different combinations of promoters and enhancers, and the slide is there for two reasons. To show you, first of all, that you can choose the level of expression you want or the duration you want by changing the promoters and enhancers, and secondly, the blue is, of course, our favorite, and that represents a human CMV enhancer with an elongation factor one alpha promoter. And by the way, that's what we used in our non-viral phase 2b trial that showed significant benefit. But the absolute key question, and wearing my clinical hat, there is no point in going any further in this program if it cannot be repeatedly administered. So here is gene expression on the vertical axis. Here is the material, the virus expressing luciferase. Each dot represents an individual mouse. And the key that you now need to do is to give two doses of the viral vector expressing some other transgene, and then come in with a third dose of the vector expressing luciferase and say, is it any different? And when we do that, you can see this is the one vector that we have ever tested that bucks the trend, and you can repeatedly administer this. You need to get a bit more grown up and move from research grade into FDA compliant material and exactly the same findings there. So the next question then for us is, this is encouraging, we're enthusiastic about the efficiency, does it actually restore chloride secretion? So here we are in an air liquid interface culture, 100% restoration of wild type CFTR. These are null cells, so if you put CFTR modulators nothing will happen. Those are two controls, and as you increase the titer of the viral vector, you can see we can completely restore chloride current, and that perhaps would, we could focus on an MOI, a multiplicity of infection of 10. In other words, we're putting 10 viral particles on per cell, roughly. So the key question is, what percentage of cells are needed to achieve that? And here, at a multiplicity of infection of 10, you can see approximately 25% of cells in that air liquid interface have to be positive. And I think that fits really well with the literature that's been there for a couple of decades, suggesting that's about the right number of cells. And the final question then is, move away from this artificial system, and in vivo, can you hit that number of cells? And here, for example, are six mice. Uh, sectioned at all sorts of different levels, and you can see we're well above that 25% level. So this gives us some encouragement that we will be able to correct chloride in vivo in the CF subjects. The next question then is, can we make enough of this lentivirus to make this a clinical success? 
And it sort of looks like this. At the beginning, there are the academics, who are these sort of puppy dog enthusiasts here, making material in the laboratory. And then you realize you need to start getting involved with these bioreactors, which keep the cells happy that spit out the virus. And there's this interesting sort of bioreactor envy that goes on, and this sort of discussion of, you know, my toy is bigger than your toy as the bioreactors get bigger and bigger. But eventually you realize that what you have to do is to talk to the professionals. And we have partnered with Oxford Biomedica, arguably the world leaders in lentivirus manufacture. And the exciting news for us, I don't know if I can go back at all, is that we are now at the 200 litre batches, these big bioreactors, and that is sufficient to produce material for a first in man trial. Now, safety is of course absolutely paramount. And the first thing we did was to ask the question, if we give a viral vector to some of our patients, are they going to get an acute viral inflammation? So we clinically benchmarked this against the liposome that we used in the phase 2b trial. So here is the amount of inflammation in a mouse's lung that you get from the lipid that we gave every month for a year in CF patients. And there is the lentivirus. So <clears throat> looks unlikely. But the second and most important question is, this is an integrating viral vector. It's got the possibility of producing tumors, oncogenesis. So is there any evidence for that? And here are a cohort of 100 mice that have been treated with our lentiviral vector, followed over a couple of years compared to the vehicle, and you can see we see no issues. Next thing we did was what you'd expect us to do, which is to look at the integration sites across the different chromosomes. It is randomly integrated. There are no hotspots, but I will come back to this topic a little bit later. The second issue is whether if you put it in the lung, will it spread elsewhere? So here is gene expression in the lung after a couple of weeks. It, of course, goes on for a long time. And then we looked at every single organ we could think of and compared to untransduced, either at two weeks or at five months, there is no evidence of spread from the lung. Please beware, these are mice, they're not inflamed lungs, but those are the data we have so far. And the third thing you should think about is when we treat these patients and then we send them home on the 65 bus and the patient sneezes over the person next to them, are they going to transmit that virus to that bystander? So to look at that, we looked at mice who have the virus in their nose at day one. It's gone by seven days. So the question is, in that seven days, are they going to transmit it? So what we need to do is to get those mice to completely ignore any sort of pretense about uh, social interactions and just get them as close as possible to each other. And we co-caged the mice. And so these in the blacker bars are mice who have been transduced. And the middle bars, in each case, are the mice that have been co-caged with them compared to a completely untransduced mice. And I think you can see whether you're looking at the nasal lavage, the bronchiolar lavage, or the lungs, there is no evidence of that sort of transmission. The next thing you need to know is whether this product is stable in commonly used nebulizers. These are four commercially available nebulizers. And I think you can see whether you put it in neat or at a dilution, and you will need to dilute this in the nebulizer, roughly 80% of the virus is viable in these nebulizers, giving us quite a lot of encouragement. So the first in human trial is going to be nebulized, well, it might be. Um, it's going to be nebulized lung delivery. Uh, it's going to be in the patients that the other speakers have spoken about, the CFTR modulator insensitive patients. It's going to be a dose escalation and then expansion of the cohort uh, that is maximally tolerated. Um, obviously, safety is a key endpoint, but also clinical endpoints, including FEV1. And we're very excited. The trial is well ongoing. We've already been to the regulators in the UK. We're interacting with the CF Foundation and we anticipate the first patient being dosed in the second half of 2023. So at this point, just for the last few minutes, I just want to go through some of the issues that we spend debating, and it'd be great to get people's views on them. Some of these issues are very large meaning of life questions. 
Um, some of them are much more focused in on cystic fibrosis. Um, and one of the questions I suppose is relevant to all of the speakers is if we're going to put CFTR in as a neal antigen in these null patients, is there going to be an immune response to the CFTR? Obviously I don't know, but here are four strands of evidence uh, to suggest that that might not be the case. You know that the premature termination codons produce a polypeptide or a protein that's misfolded. You know that the cell has this process called nonsense-mediated decay gets rid of them. There is very good evidence now that that is not faultless, and about 1% of the full-length protein is read through. Secondly, there is this pioneer stage of translation where the mRNA is checked before you start getting translation of the polypeptide. And it is clear that peptides are being read through all the time in that pioneer phase and presented to the cell's immune system. Thirdly, you will know that the stop codons are often quite proximal in CFTR. And in fact, there are alternative start sites distal to that. And those peptides produced from those start sites can induce tolerance. And finally, we don't just inherit our antigens, we get some of them through the placental circulation from our mothers. And of course, that is another way, this microchimerism of being tolerized. And finally, very glibly, I don't think anybody's yet seen any evidence of this tolerization to this new antigen. So our view is that this risk is fairly low. Now, the next point here is, I've come back to this point about the potential for oncogenesis, and the theory is absolutely clear and straightforward. When your lentivirus or your retrovirus integrates itself into your genome, what it does is it integrates some of these long terminal repeats, which are identical sequences at each end of its genome. And so you see these here, these are the long terminal repeats just here, but the key is it includes a promoter from your retro or lentivirus. If that integration has been close to another promoter that you have in your cellular DNA and that promoter encouraged the production of a cellular oncogene, you can see where mischief can begin to happen. Promote this, promote that, cellular oncogene, and you get problems. And the Dumbledore magic here is obvious. What you have to do is just remove these long terminal repeats, and that should make it much safer. And so that's what's happening, and the world is moving to self inactivating vectors called sin vectors that have got this long terminal repeat removed. And so the theory says to us that a modern vector should mitigate that risk. Now, I think we should be data-driven rather than theory-driven. So we've tried to collect together every single patient in the world that has been treated either with a gamma retrovirus or a lentivirus. So here are the patients treated with a gamma retrovirus that do have this long terminal repeat. Each square represents an individual patient. The gray represents there were no problems. The blue represents the fact that there were tumors produced. And sadly, the red represents that these, these produced mortality. So that is the evidence, as best I know, for gamma retroviruses. In terms of lentiviruses, Bluebird Bio have undertaken a trial in these cerebral adrenoleukodystrophy patients, really sick patients, and they continue to use this long terminal repeat. 67 patients, three cases of tumours, no deaths. In contrast, I believe there are now 258 patients in the world that have been treated with these self-inactivating lentiviruses, and I think you can see there is not a single case of tumours. So in our view, the data suggests the theory is correct, and that is the safe way to go forward. A third issue here is what are the factors that are going to um, affect redosing? And I assume that with an integrating viral vector, expression will last for the lifetime of a cell. So the question is, which cell are we going to integrate into? Well, we've got a choice. We could integrate into a stem or progenitor cell, and I think if we do that, we should get lifelong expression. Why wouldn't you? If you integrate into a terminally differentiated cell, that cell will slough off, and you really, really won't get uh, long-lasting expression beyond the lifetime of that cell. So 
In the proximal airways, I think we all know in this room, the proximal airways are pseudostratified epithelium. The basal cells are probably the stem or progenitors. They are extraordinarily well hidden. I do not believe we are routinely going to hit those basal cells through nebulization. And therefore, that suggests that in the proximal airways, we should be focusing in on the lifespan of terminally differentiated cells. We have spent years asking every expert in the world what is the lifespan of a terminal differentiated cell, and the answer is dunno, but mostly it's somewhere between 3 and 18 months, and I would point out this is certainly longer than the current longevity of a British Prime Minister. <laughs> In the distal airways, the anatomy is very different. It's not pseudostratified, it's a monolayer, and there the progenitor cells are probably the club cells, and they are much more accessible. So I think there may be differences in terms of the duration of expression that you see, perhaps in the proximal airways and in the more distal uh, airways. And the final factor that I just want to focus on is this issue of if I was a person with CF, how would I think about all these wonderful trials that are being talked about uh, this morning? There are lots of them. They're all targeted at the modulator insensitive population. They're really exciting, but they're not standard therapies and the regulators won't see them as standard therapies. And we certainly know that we would need to do longer term uh, follow up. So if I was a patient, I need to begin to weigh up the delivery efficiency that's being promised, the safety, the complexity of the protocol, will I get the drug after the trial, etc. And I wonder whether people with CF may want to try one of these fantastic therapies. If it works, fantastic, I'll stick with it. But if it doesn't work, maybe I want to try the next one. But the issue here is that the sponsors of these trials probably do want a pure population because they want to follow them through in terms of side effects, etc., etc. And I just think there might be an issue about watching out for the exclusion criteria in these trials to allow CF people to be nimble in their choice of trials. So at that point, I just want to conclude and say, I think we have a fairly efficient virus. It gives long-lasting expression. It's repeatable. It's manufactured at scale. We don't see any safety problems today. And we are moving rapidly to a first in-man trial. So I just want to say a big thank you to everybody in the consortium, all our funders, and that's our website address. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for truly world-class presentations. You gave us all very tangible, accessible information, and it's absolutely wonderful. Um, if I could invite all four of our speakers back up, and we will open up to questions and answers that you've submitted. Okay. So thanks very much, everyone, for the talks. I, I'm sure people agree this is such an exciting space. And if we look back even just a few years, the amount of attention and focus that's now going into this space has been probably even more than exponential, whatever the term for that is. Um, I think that that does raise quite a lot of... Um, sorry, you're all very huddled. This is not well set up for what we've been asked to deliver. It wasn't our choice, by the way, to do the questions like this. Please don't tip Eric off the stage. He's quite valuable at the moment. Um, I think it raises uh, quite a lot of challenges for us, doesn't it, in terms of how we deliver these and, and particularly some of the areas that were raised during Marty and then Eric's um, talk about this actually quite small population and so many opportunities for different trials coming along in quite a tight space of time. Um, I think one of the people, maybe Jen, said actually 6% of the population. I think probably it's not the 10% that everybody talks about. Certainly in many regions, it may be higher in others. But I think what's also important is that we start to look at the eligibility criteria of some of these, and we will see that percentage come down really quite dramatically, I think. And then there's also the uh, patients who are prepared to put themselves through these early phase trials and who have the time and the, and the commitment to do that, as well as the decision about which one they go in. And I think that would be a hard enough decision to make if we were offering trials to people at the same time, but we're not. We're probably in a situation where we're open for a study and we might know that another one's coming in the 
in the sort of relatively medium term future, but not yet be able to talk about it. So I think there's all sorts of complex issues here. And, um, you know, it would be good to perhaps have some discussion about that as we go on. We do have a number of questions. Thank you very much for putting those in and we will go through them, but encourage people to uh, put new questions on it as you think of them. Um, I think it wouldn't be completely, we're probably not gonna get sacked if we allow someone to shout out a question. We will repeat it into the microphone because this is being recorded and I think will be available later. Um, but I think perhaps for those people who don't work well with apps, if you want to put your hand up and shout out, then I'm sure we can allow that sort of question. Um, Claire, do you want to sure. kick off? Sure. I'm also slightly at risk of falling I off here, but I will um, <laughs> <laughs> Imperial we, we College need you will too, wipe James. down yes, to yes. the first We need post. you too, so don't fall. Um, so we have a number of questions. Maybe we'll start with Jennifer. A um, number of questions came through in the A101. Um, so has the A101 receptor been identified? And number two, a key attribute for A101 is that it was uh, listed as having excellent mucus penetrating ability. And how was that demonstrated? So it was um, looked at, as I showed, in non-human primates. So it wasn't looked at in CF mucus. It was looked at in the mucus that's in non-human primates that rheologically is very similar to that in the normal human. And as I'll piggyback onto those questions, so I mean, this is kind of applicable to all the speakers. Um, a number of the preclinical was done in various animal models, non-human primates, mentioned ferrets. Some were CF models, some were not. Um, and do you feel there's more information or not to be gleaned from CF versus non-CF models? And moving on into our CF patients, some are on modulators, some are not. Um, and this, the thick, dense mucus and that penetrating ability is a big barrier. Um, would it be a difference if you were enrolling modulator um, patients taking modulators versus not in terms of gene expression and hope for success? So I, that I could open up to anyone. Do you want to go first, Eric? Yeah. Uh, oh, let's see. <laughs> um, um, I think it's a really good question. Um, I think the CF mucus probably is a bit different. And if we could get access to animal models that were freely available everywhere, I think it would be really helpful to test the accessibility uh, in them. I, th I think that that would be uh, very helpful indeed, I think. Um, we, we don't have easy access to CF pigs or CF ferrets, etc. So I think that would, would be helpful. I think the other thing is, maybe we should also consider <coughs> the difference between the first dose and other doses, because if the first dose actually does something and actually works, you may not be going into the same environment the second and the third time. Okay. I guess we could affect the timing for redosing independent of... Yeah, so w which may affect the timing for redosing independent of the kind of expression levels and that, that factor as well. So I think you're, you're right. It's a good point. Jane? I was just going to say that one issue aside from access to the animals and the issues that you pointed out with the ferrets is, I mean, the tropism. And so trying to go back and forth between making sure it works in that animal and is it actually still going to work in the human. I mean, I think the question about modulators is a great one. And as I mentioned for our program, that we're actually planning on moving into people with modulators eventually. And it may, whether it works the first time or whether you are on modulators, make it easier to penetrate. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And in fact, modulator use may facilitate some of this. There's, there's so many unknowns, of course, with mucus and the, and the effects that that will have. Though most of our vectors are based on, on, on organisms that can very happily transverse the, um, the mucus and infect and cause colds and flus, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll see. At one point I wanted to make that you brought up earlier, Jane, was um, about the fact that we're looking at these trials and they're coming sequentially, not necessarily all at the same time. And one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that TDN has done is started to talk to the investigators about whether or not you want to have multiple trials at your institution, but also, more importantly, I think, created a regional consortium. We're going to start meeting, I think, right after this meet, after this conference. And so groups are going to meet on a monthly or every other month basis that are in the same region so that they can facilitate the referral process so that in this very tiny population, we can make sure that we're optimizing all of the centers, even if they don't necessarily have the opportunity at their site to do gene therapy. And I think that's going to have to happen worldwide. 
That's a good point, and it is something that we've done in UK in the past, and we'll certainly be doing. But of course, the distances are much smaller there, aren't they? So, you know, particularly for a trial early phase intensive, requiring a lot of visits, to be expecting people to hop on and off planes and travel quite long distances is something that's quite difficult, I think, isn't it? One concept that's come out of these consortium is that in, as the trial designs evolve, the concept of the longer term safety follow maybe could be done as kind of a spoken wheel type of model where the cent decentralized sites could handle some of that longer term follow up to minimize that, you know, I mean, think about it, the 4 DMT trials is, a, is essentially a two year study for a one time dosing, mm. which is interesting, you know, so I think that may be one thing that can sure. evolve over time, especially as remote endpoints sort of evolve and whatnot. Yeah. Eric? Sorry about this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it's not rocket science, is it? <laughs> Um, just also to make the blindingly obvious point that mucus is not mucus and there is the contiguous layer of mucus across the airway epithelium and then there are the discontinuous lumps that we clinicians eventually end up saying this is sputum. I think it's very difficult to get through those great lumps, those boulders moving along, but they are heterogeneous and discontinuous. So I think there's just that difference as well. Just while we're on that point, somebody has put a question on the app um, related to the HSV and whether there's any data about mucus penetration with that. Peter, please. Um, so again, it was, it was applied to the non-human primate model and, and so was able to get into lung tissue quite effectively. But of course, that's not C CF mucus. Um, so really the same point, I think. So could I just ask a question then? Um, people will be aware from Eric's talk that the ethos of the Gene Therapy Consortium has very much been a find out whether something can be given repeatedly before we go into all the trouble of tooling up for a clinical trial. And that just listening to the other speakers, I'm not sure that is an ethos that is, has been adopted by everyone, but I wondered whether either of you could share any preclinical data um, at all to suggest that this has been looked at with those viral vectors. Um, is, that, is that data that you're at liberty to talk about? I'm going to look at my colleagues in the audience and say, am I allowed to say or not? <laughs> okay. So, I mean, the plan is to look at non-human primates to look at repeat dosing. Okay. So I, I think the um, only data that I'm aware of is the application in um, in dystrophic epidemia, epidermolysis bullosa, and um, and at least over that follow-up period of time, there, there there wasn't an obvious problem and and no significant antibody production that that inhibited efficacy. But uh, but again, over to the crystal people, if there's anything else they'd want to add. But. Okay. Thanks. And I will say that there wasn't any inflammation at all seen in the non-human primate histology that was looked at with the initial dose. Again, they were given prednisone, but... I'm, I'm just not sure whether they could be two separate things, couldn't they? Immune right. stimulation versus inflammation might not right. necessarily go right. together, so... And, and, and the primates did have a, a low level of this um, mixed inflammatory, sort of very, very low level inflammatory response, whether... That, that's just a feature of nebulizing almost anything in a, in a non-human primate model, I, I guess is the question. Didn't seem to cause some problems, but I, I think it's been seen before. Just, just while we're on that, um, given how common HSV is in the human population, is there any relationship at all with levels of pre-existing antibodies and your uh, likelihood of seeing an impact in terms of transfection? And is that anything that's in your inclusion exclusion criteria? So, yeah, so um, in, again, going back to the skin condition, um, pre-existing antibodies didn't seem to impact upon efficacy. Um, our, um, our OGTR, which is a government department that allowed the, the, the conduct of the trial, were very particular that we would not mix um, replicating HSV, wild-type HSV, with the, with the viral incompetent replicant. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. Um, uh, so we have to exclude anybody who has an active skin lesion um, or be actively, um, we think, uh, secreting HSV. They had some very, very intense uh, requirements before that, but have, have relaxed those now. Um, there's also requirements that people wear masks and, and, and try and avoid intimate contact after, for a period of time after the, the, um, the use of the agent. I mean, these seem to be all fairly theoretical risks. The, the virus is completely incompetent. It, it, it really shouldn't be able to combine with a wild-type virus. And 
And I will say that we did actually look at pre-existing antibodies in those in the cohort one, and it didn't impair the transduction and expression, at least with this first dose. Okay. With 4D, Jen, um, are there thoughts about determining when sufficient expression has been achieved to be able to progress to phase two? Or do you feel that's already happened? Well, I think that we were pleasantly surprised by the amount of expression that we got with the low dose. So I think it's going to depend on how much better it looks with the high dose and the tolerance, which we should find out very soon, because that cohort's already enrolling. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and it speaks to um, the um, endpoints and outcomes, of course, and we simply don't know <laughs> um, how much is enough and, um, and, and how much is enough both to see a clinical effect or how much is enough to, to make a real change. I think that's, that's very exploratory still. And, and for me, sticking with that point, and for you, Marty, I know you're developing this, nasal, this sorry, the potential difference of the lower airways, um, but your measurement is, I guess, how far into the how distally into the airways, because you know the surface area of the lung is enormous. Often, right. You know. Yeah. It's um, and, and would that be representative, though? I acknowledge in Jennifer's presentation, you know, maybe six percent or eight percent expression may be enough. Um, but how do we know that that is representative of the entire yeah. airway? Yeah, it's a great question. So we obviously cannot assay to the the you know the bronchioles. We can go to you know a, a second, you know, a, a sort of a third ter generation bronchus safely with the catheter, and that's where we typically would would assay from, you know, in multiple sites, or single or multiple sites. We can't answer the question, the terminal bronchus, obviously it's important. However, we found that that correlates with, you know, with other in vitro studies in the past. So we think that if you can activate in the larger airways, that may suggest activation in the lower airways. Of course, that doesn't, that assumes that the nebulization is efficient down to that, the, the, the distal. So I think that, that is a limitation of that type of assay. Um, you know, and so we, it's something we have to just think about. Um, but there, there's definitely a correlation curve of activation of CFTR with potential difference measures if we can just start establishing that a bit, you know, for the lower airway as well. So, Can I just pick up on that, having gone through the pain with Eric of doing yeah. these measurements in our previous Phase 2B liposome trial? Um, you mentioned a number of uh, limitations to lower airway PD, but I'm not sure what came across was the variability, the, the yeah. real variability, uh, particularly in the basal measurements, which we mm -hmm. found even on four walls of the central airways, they were different. Um, probably less so with the chloride responses because right. they're pretty absent anyway, so you may be able to see them. Um, but I wonder whether you've got a handle on that yet in your cohort. But also, the other thing that surprised me was um, you mentioned this might happen in patients even without sedation. Um, if they're quite long procedures and presumably you'd be making them at more than one site. And, um, you know, patients will cough if they've got mm. lower airway disease and they're not asleep. And I wonder how you sort of plan to deal with that because, I mean, we spent probably an hour per patient doing all of the things we were doing. I, I don't think the patients would have liked to have been awake and I'm not sure we could have even got the data we did if they were coughing throughout it. Sure. So just wonder if those things have been thought about. Absolutely. We, the in, initial studies would be with sedated patients. However, we hope that the catheter could eliminate the need for bronchoscopy, which you know simulates a lot of the cough having the larger catheter. And we think that may, be, that may allow the potential to test if we can standardize certain measurement areas that are more efficient over time that would allow that to be a potential. But we're, we're obviously not there yet. Okay. That's a good point. Okay. I, I should have said that's a longer term in a uh, longer term outcome we hope I'm to achieve. Glad you're doing yeah. it. Yeah, right. Well, and I, I would just say, yeah, no, it's, a, it's hopefully going to be an option, but that also actually would really limit the number of sites without a lot of training for where people could go in this very tiny, tiny population. So another consideration. And I know many of you are involved either in ongoing or design of these clinical trials. And one of the questions that came through alluded to, you know, are patients aware of the head of time as they're um, consenting to enroll that these might be short term, maybe they do benefit, but there's a short term benefits. Um, what if it did work for them? And how do we, could you ensure or give them information on further enrollments um, or um, that the effect might wear off? Yeah, those are great questions. Another thing that the TDN has done, aside from working really hard to educate research coordinators and clinicians who don't do as much um, in this research area. They've created these 
really great videos and other educational materials, but they're also doing that for people with CF. And they've gone out into the community and surveyed pre and post these educational videos to see if it's actually improving their awareness and understanding. I mean, of course, it's not perfect, but I think that more and more people are becoming aware of the limitations of these early studies because of the work that the foundation's doing. We had exactly the same problem with our non-viral phase 2b trial where we had a lot of patients who really really did get better and a lot of tears at there is no more material to carry on uh, and that was a real issue um, with our lentiviral trial i don't think i'm at liberty yet to uh, say what the protocol is but we've taken this very strongly into consideration I want to, uh, on the topic of trial design, again, I know you've mentioned the FDA guidance and, again, in development of these early phase trials. I believe you didn't mention a placebo group, Jennifer, um, but the, the Crystal Bio and the other are mentioning placebo groups. Um, and, and how is that consideration taken? And how do you think it may impact recruitment? And why is it important or not to have a placebo group? Oh, no, go ahead. I think it's absolutely critical to have a placebo group to, to see what's real and what's not real when you're delivering all these new things. Certainly we've got a placebo group as part of it. Then the ethical question is what's going to happen to the placebo group if it's successful? And again, not at liberty to say, but we've obviously spent a lot of time, as I'm sure others have, thinking about crossovers and designs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, I mean, it, we, it was a big discussion for a long period of time about whether we should do a placebo in this very first one we're getting back into this group. And we decided because of the risk to the placebo group of like having not gotten anything and maybe not being able to be redosed that we, for this very first study, would not use a placebo group. I mean, we hope that we're still going to see, as we have in the cohort one, the expression um, that suggests that we should keep going. Could I just make a plea to people on that then, um, that... If somebody's been in a previous trial and you're excluding people from previous trials, then there should be an exemption for somebody who only got placebo in that previous trial once that's unblinded, because that would be totally unethical, I think. Um, you know, it's, it's questionable scientifically in other regards as well, but I think for a placebo group to be excluded would be really tough. I'm sure you... It's like already come up at our site. We've already had a patient that excluded themselves because of that exact question. You know, you're talking about yeah. a very limited number of patients yeah. that are willing and meet all the IE, you know, the, the huge checklist of IE for these studies. And that's already come up at our site, and, and I know that's come up other sites too, so I think that is a, absolutely going to have to be addressed. And I think as a result, we're going to have to really think about what is the time frame in which we, you should be excluded long term? Should you, you know, have gotten the therapy in the future? Could you cross over another therapy way down the line, you know, as these develop, or the placebo groups? I think both of those groups that the, our willing participants need to be considered if we're going to get this done. Mm -hmm. Eric. And I'm sure you're thinking about it in exactly the same way. Maybe there's a difference between the dose escalation phase for placebo and the dose expansion phase when you might want to bring in the placebo. I'm sure you're thinking yeah. in exactly the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, are we doing that? It's a rule breaker. Jord oh. Jordan's <laughs> over here trying to, yeah, yeah I'm going to cause you to get fired. Oh, yeah. up for it. Go on. <laughs> Okay, let me just repeat that then. Would the, if there was a placebo group, would it be an empty vector or not a vector? I think I'm not allowed to say so. Um, yeah. <laughs> we, we don't know, nor can they say. <laughs> you know, I, I, the theoretical downside to me of it being an empty vector is that person could very well then be excluded from future studies. Exactly. So, hmm. Not at liberty to say, but <laughs> I, don't, I think there's a lot of downsides to that. And I don't know that ethics committees like it either. Can I just say we were severely criticised by the reviewers at the New England Journal for our choice of placebo in the non-viral trial. The obvious thing to do is to do a vector that was not, it was expressing mutated CFTR. That seems the perfect one. We couldn't afford that. It was six million pounds just for the placebo. And we didn't have that sort of money. We then went to the liposome, but the liposome alone can also do things. I know we're not talking about liposomes here, and so you might want to think just about the diluent. There are pluses and minuses to all of these issues, and they're both pragmatic and theoretical, and you're not allowed to talk about them. <laughs> I mean, there, there's 
an element of what the purpose of the placebo is, right? If the placebo is for clinical efficacy, then you, you, you might design the placebo a bit differently than if you were designing it for a placebo to compare to immunogenicity or that kind of thing, then obviously you might want to have the empty vector there. So I think there's just a lot of factors there that obviously this group is more adept to answer than I am, but it seems like those are the kind of questions that come to my mind. Yeah, it's important to know whether you're for blinding or for yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. outcome measure readout. Right. Yeah. Jen? Uh, oh, sorry, Peter. It, it, it's, it's probably worth considering as well that we, we probably need to think about how we do construct these early phase trials. And, and even the FDA guidance very, very heavily takes on the, the, the big existing um, understanding from oncology trials. And, and we're really talking and considering about a, an entirely different approach with entirely different outcomes and, and issues like this about excluding people if they've taken part in early phase trials and, and having pure populations, et cetera. It, 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 there, there are a lot of things to really think about if we're going to move this field forward. And, and I mean, we're only going to know by actually doing the trials and then assembling data and looking to see what changes and what doesn't change. But um, it's probably a reasonable thing to say we, we shouldn't be too stuck in the past, particularly when some of those, those early phase trials that, and, and, the, and the mechanisms and, and the ways of doing things are perhaps not so fit for purpose. But. I agree. And I think if ever there was a time to not be stuck in our individual silos, but be learning off the progress of other groups around us, then it mm. is now, because we really need to do this collegiately. And that was part of the reason for, for this group coming together today, to try and do that as much as possible, I think. You know, one thing I w have thought about, and this is in my simplified brain, about this whole the recruitment and also the angst about these studies is we don't, we have not had a successful trial go far enough where there's like a home run. Like, you know, until we, I mean, I remember I was coming into CF when Ivacaftor was its, in its infancy, right? And once the home run of the kind of phase two trials of Ivacaftor, it was like, oh, oh, wait, this is, this can do, we can do this. It's no problem. We've got a, we've got a, a pathway. We've got safety. There's no issues here. And then it was like the recruitment helped. I mean, I think we need a couple of home runs that show, all right, there's not a lot of, maybe not that much danger. There can be some, maybe some efficacy endpoints. And so we can say, look, this is a feasible situation rather than dwelling on old pasts, you know? And, and so I think maybe we're still there a little bit. I think the other thing that we have found is that people have gotten really used to the phase three trials of modulators, which are not nearly as involved as these trials are. I'm sure it was difficult probably in the beginning for you guys to recruit, and we're finding that here because people aren't used to being in the clinic for 12, 14 hours and doing bronchoscopies and all of these things. So sort of retraining our participants about what we have to do for safety in these early trials is key. Anyone else want to break the rules and shout out? <laughs> Make this guy feel less of an outlier. <laughs> oh, okay, have we got more on there? Um, we do. Oh, great. What is the minimum effect size you would want to have in this kind of trial? <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> what is the minimum <coughs> clinical effect size any of you would wish to have in this trial? Um, I will say that. I was very skeptical of the Lumacaptor Ivacaptor day, but when I saw it, but then over time, the way it stabilized patients so we could get them to the next step made me think differently about that. So I would be perfectly happy with a very relatively small effect size that was going to stabilize people for a while until we found the next best thing because these people right now are quite desperate when they watch their peers. Um, there's a paper that we published looking at a survey of participants who were not able to participate in the modulator trials. They were ineligible. They didn't have access. in the trauma that they're experiencing is far deeper than I think a lot of us realize if you don't go through and read the individual quotes. So they're very, very desperate. And so I think if we could just stabilize them for a bit, that would be a goal that's worth getting. Eric? Okay, Sorry, Eric and then Mark. Fine, I'll go. I, I agree with Jen. I, it, from, a not, from the genetic-based therapies world, but thinking about advancing modulators to patients that have kind of, you know, less responsive mutations, that was exactly the benchmarking that we saw, saw it was, all right, can we restore enough CFTR when you're thinking about it, preclinical assays that then would translate into a Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor, maybe a Simdico type ex, you know, experience for those patients. And I think that would be a great benchmark to think about here. Can we restore enough CFTR preclinical? Maybe that's you know, 10 to 20%, which is about what Lumacaftor might do. And then can we then pair that with assays to establish that? And that may be the benchmarking for these initial trials. So I agree 100%, I think, because of that experience. So 
definitely, definitely that was, a, I think, a good exposure experience, the Lumicaptor, because it taught us a lot about a moderately effective CFTR activating therapy. Thank you. Can I also agree with Jen that I think stab stabilizing would be fantastic. Just to go back to the non-viral trial we did, it stabilized lung function. It stabilized every year. Would any pharma company buy it? No. And the issue here is the cost of goods as well. And so I think there is a question, there is a, not only a metric and a benchmark of stabilizing lung function, but there is a cost of goods issue as well. And we're in quite high cost of good territory, I suspect. Thanks, Deepika. So, so just in case people didn't hear that, I think a really valid point about the studies are going to be small, at least at this stage, and that might mean in terms of the design that the effect size powered for needs to be higher. Um, that's certainly something I think that needs bearing in mind. It's a weighing up situation, isn't it? Yeah. Well, even, even the concept of moving to a phase three trial probably needs to be thought through. Um, I, I mean, if we get anybody to the point where we're looking at a phase three trial, uh, we've got such small numbers of individuals that, are, that, that potentially would be eligible, it would have to be, it would have to be a, a, a big collaborative effort, I think. Or you know, one of you could develop a more sensitive marker, that would be really great. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free that I can get out of that business then. Yeah. Feel free. Yeah. <laughs> I just warmly agree with that. I don't think we need to start doing phase 2B, phase 3, phase 1 slash 2A. I wonder what it is we're actually doing today. I think they just need to be rolled through exactly as you say. And I think the regulators, at least in the UK, are very up for that. Could we spend a minute or two discussing bronchoscopies? Because I think when we sort of went through the various presentations, there was more or less emphasis put on some of those bronchoscopic outcomes, in particular gene expression. So, Jen, yours was sort of quite up there. Peter, I think you said you were looking for gene expression in the buccal mucosa, but I didn't see anything about the lower airway. Eric, I can't remember whether you said anything. Um, but, um, you know, in, in terms of the relative merits of the invasive nature versus what we can learn from the sampling that's comes out of that, maybe, maybe people's thoughts, not necessarily specific to your own trial, if you're not allowed to say, but, but what do people think in terms of, of how much we should try and learn from these early phase trials? Let's have a go at that, because I think if we get a 15% change in FEV1 absolute, everybody will go, great, why did we need any molecular surrogates? Job done. I think it's more if we get a, oh, it looks quite interesting, it's, say, 5% change in FEV1. It's very reassuring to have the molecular surrogates say that this was gene transduction and not because of the, wi the wind was blowing in the southerly direction that day. So I think it's for that. And I think if you're building a bigger program and a long-term program, it's really helpful to have those building blocks. If it knocks our socks off, who cares? Yeah, well, and particularly when you're doing dose finding, I mean, I think it does pro provide that reinsurance to keep going to the next dose if it's safe at the first dose, and then moving on to an expansion. Yeah, so the, um, the, the, the US-based trials will, will include bronchoscopy, but um, I, I'd echo the same sorts of um, feelings. I mean, uh, if there's a very small change, then, then looking for airway tissue tropism is, is obviously very important. If there's a bigger change, it, it probably doesn't matter. And what are people's feelings about the sensitivity of the assays at the moment and, and how, you know, would a negative close your program down in the absence of a blow your socks off um, change in FEV1? 
I mean, I think at the low dose, I don't know that it would have closed it down, <clears throat> but the higher dose, if you get there and you're still seeing nothing, I feel like most sponsors are not going to have the funding to keep going. I think you're absolutely right. The problem is the sampling, isn't it? We're sampling so little of this airway with our bronchoscopies. We're only going to get down to third or fourth generation airways, and we're just taking, well, we, we, we can manage 10, bronch, 10 brushings and four biopsies. I mean, the total surface area compared to the denominator is tiny. But I still suspect that funders are going to say, who cares? <laughs> This is a slight change of type, but this is quite an interesting question, and I don't think I've ever thought about it. It's specifically for Eric. Um, is it feasible to incorporate the targeting capability of FHN with non-viral systems, e.g. liposomes, to take advantage of those systems, lower immunogenicity, repeat dosing, etc.? And then, similarly, um, do you know how the pseudotype virus escapes the immune surveillance? So... so I think what the questioner is asking is, why don't you put the FHM protein on some liposomes? And um, not to bore you, but 25 years ago, this all started with me going to Japan and producing these FHN liposomes uh, out in Osaka and bringing them back. Sadly, they didn't work. And I think they don't work because the stereo, the 3D stereochemistry of the FHM proteins is not easily maintained in a liposome. So it's been brilliantly done by Yasufumi Kaneda in Osaka, and it doesn't work. Um, what was the second question? Uh, do we know how it evades the immune system? Uh, we are getting inklings of how it evades the immune system, but I think we're not at liberty, unfortunately, to say that just at the moment. Are there any topics that the panel think we haven't covered that would be worth some more discussion? We've got another sort of five or eight minutes. Hi, Paddy. Good question. So if you've stabilized somebody and they're now producing CFTR, could you modulate them with small molecule drugs? So, so um, over the last 10 years, we've been trying to persuade people based on data that if we put in normal wild type CFTR with an open probability of 0.4, surely Ivacafta will increase that open probability and we have the data available. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time talking to the company you'd expect us to be talking to about it. Uh, that didn't find favour, and we're having those discussions continuously at the moment. It's such an obvious combination. But then again, yes, we're running into massive costs, as you pointed out earlier. So we're, we're, we're looking at that with our organoid model, but um, yeah, ramping that up in terms of costs and, um, and practicalities is the issue. Yep. There are other modulator producers, so. <laughs> uh, yes. Just a quick shout out uh, to respond to the last question. We have cluster 666, which demonstrates NTD delivery with IvoCaptor and eMRNA showing the synergy. Okay, so anybody who's interested, please go and see poster 666. It's not as Halloweenish as it sounds, <laughs> I'm sure, but we'll all remember that number. So, we, yeah, we'll all be piling in. Okay, so LMPs plus Ivacafta? Yeah. Okay. Great. I don't think we're obliged to go up to the minute if we've run out of questions. Was there anything else, Claire, on here, do you think? No, okay, well, I'd like to thank all our speakers in particular, but also those of you who managed to navigate the app and those of you who shouted out. I think it's been a really, really interesting session. It's a very encouraging time and space with a lot of things we need to think about, and we need to think about them now, not, yet, not next year or next month, I think. So hopefully this will kickstart some of those thoughts and conversations even more than they're already happening. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you.